Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with my review of AEW Dynamite for Wednesday, July 6th, 2022. A lot to discuss on this show, so let's dive right in, beginning with a street fight for the TNT Championship as Wardlow challenges Scorpio Sky, who of course is accompanied by Dan Lambert and all those folks from American Top Team. Excalibur mentioning during the entrances that it was MJF who cost Wardlow the belt the last time Wardlow faced off of Scorpio Sky. I think that's the first time they've mentioned him on air that I can recall. If it's not the first, it feels like one of the first. A Scorpio hit and dick kick City on Wardlow fairly early on in this thing. It is a street fight after all. Lambert gets involved and it leads to all the ATT guys attacking Wardlow for a minute before the break. After commercial, Wardlow hits a great picture-perfect swanton bomb, beats down more of the American Top Team guys. Scorpio hits him with the belt, but Wardlow kicks out. Uh, Lambert's knocked off the apron. Wardlow takes control. Multiple power bombs. the foot on the chest to pin and win and emphatically Wardlow wins and is the new TNT champion because the pyro and everything uh, so cool to see uh, Wardlow is definitely on fire right now I don't think his stock has ever been higher not since you know for beating the MJF for instance uh, I think he's just he's carried that momentum very well here it feels very natural for him to kind of move on to something a little more serious than this little feud the feud he had with Mark Sterling for example uh, you know I think Scorpio I think his run as champion this particular reign might have been better, but he was so bogged down with the Sammy Guevara, Ty Conti stuff, and that whole storyline was confusing because it was really hard to determine just who were the heels in this exchange. But uh, you, you wish he could have had more time after that, but I don't think he's done. I think there's still time and there's an opportunity for him to be in some other championship picture or to keep men of the year relevant and busy, and I hope they don't lose momentum after this either. But I think that, uh, you know, yeah, great win for Wardlow is all I can say. John Moxley cuts a promo talking about how lots of people have lost money betting against him. He talks about how much fun it was. Fun is the word he used to be in blood and guts last week. He described it as a golf outing, a Sunday golf trip basically is how he described it. He also talks about uh, his match with Brody King later in the show and he asks Brody if his heart is big enough basically to hang with Moxley. Backstage we see Tony Nese and Mark Sterling on a bit of a quest to get a petition filled out to try and get Swerve Strickland kicked out of AEW. He tries to get uh, Swerve's partner Keith Lee to sign it, but Lee says, hey, we have our problems, but we're still a team, we're still partners, and we're still winning, unlike you guys. Ooh, sick burn. Christian Cage and evil Luchasaurus make their way to the ring. Christian has the mic and he wants to address the people who have been asking him, why is Luchasaurus still on his side after the big breakup of Jurassic Express? Before he can say anything, though, Matt Hardy interrupts. He calls Christian the Michael Jordan of assholes, but Christian just goes right for the kill, right, the, right at the get-go, and says that Matt sounds is making his brother sound like he is the sober one, which gets a big audible, ooh, I can't believe he did that kind of sound. Uh, Matt says he, he, he regrets the big money Matt ways of old, his evil ways, and he wants to try and make up for that and everything. And uh, Christian says that Matt's got a big ego, he can't stand not being in the spotlight. He says you'll rely on your kids and your wife and your father-in-law and a dilapidated boat and a lawnmower, but, and you also turn a blind eye to your brother's issues and ride his coattails for one last run. Another big, oh, I can't believe he went there sound. And then finally he says, you know, your brother's not the biggest disappointment in your family. You are. Them's fighting words. Matt goes to the attack, but then evil Luchasaurus beats him up, choke slams him through the timekeeper's table on the outside, and that's uh, how that segment ends. So based on the last few weeks of promos, it's my understanding that Christian Cage's whole gimmick now is he goes there. I feel like he's kind of put in that slot that MJF used to occupy before he left where it's like, hey, I'm talking about these real life things as well. And it's this behind the scenes stuff and it's designed to get these big, I can't believe he went there reactions. Now Christian is doing almost the exact same thing. And uh, I don't want it to be a thing where it kind of got with MJF where I felt things were losing their oomph after a while and became kind of like a one trick thing because Christian has so much more to give. And I think that his promos can be very good. Maybe not constantly, you know, ripping stories from the headlines and constantly referencing the real life stuff um, to just to, you know, get that reaction. I think he can do uh, do fine without that. But, you know, again, it's a balance. We'll have to see what that what that's like. But again, having Matt Hardy and Christian there using their history to kind of further build the heat toward uh, for, for Cage, I think that was a good move. We get a blood and guts recap from last week. Then we see a little face-to-face -face between Claudio Castagnoli and Jake Hager, the real Americans sharing screen time once again. But there's a no violence uh, agreement for this 
thing here. So Hager running Claudio down and saying, you know, you couldn't become a world champion in ROH, couldn't become one in WWE, and it's time that he, Jake Hager, gets some respect. Claudio says the people who ask for respect, they don't deserve it. He talks about his recent accomplishments since uh, joining AEW, beating Zack Sabre Jr., being on the winning team in Blood and Guts. He says Jake's arm was taped while his was raised, and next week on Rampage, he's going to make it three and zero, pointing right at Jake, the supposed zero in this confrontation. I thought that was really cool. It was nice that they, they kind of brought up their history. They don't shy away from that, which I think is great. And it's a ready-made heat. Like, you know, you have a match next week with the tw between the two of them. You don't need to build up much longer than that. Like, Pete fans, most fans of a, of a certain vintage know the history between these two. And if not, I think they did a pretty good, a decent job catching people up a little bit in the last just couple of weeks alone. So, and they'll probably do more of that, uh, more of the same next Wednesday, right, right before their match. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. And it's just like that history there, the real Americans. All we need now is Dutch Mantel to show up and try and play Peacemaker. Up next, The Butcher and The Blade take on Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland. Early on, Swerve and Blade go for a leapfrog spot, but there's a bit of miscommunication or a timing issue. They accidentally collide, which is unfortunate. Uh, you've got Swerve taking a lot of the heat in this match as it goes on. It goes through a commercial break. Near the end, you can see Swerve actually biting The Blade's hand to give himself a bit of breathing room here. We think he's done, but, but Keith Lee with a very, very late save. Almost. I'd have to go back and watch it back. I haven't yet, but I'm pretty sure they were able to make it seem like it wasn't an obvious three count. The fans disagree. There was definitely some boos when that pinfall got broken up. So anyway, Swerve in their glory hit swerve in their glory to, in order to win the matchup. And then after the bell, Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks make their way to the ring and they're very full of piss and vinegar. They're very angry here about them winning the matchup and Starks screaming that Lee and Swerve are several levels below them. Suddenly out come the AEW Tag Champs, the Young Bucks. Matt says he would apologize for interrupting, but he doesn't have to apologize because they helped build this company. And he says, it's good to see everyone in the tag division currently eating well, but don't forget who set that table in the first place and uh, Nick with a bit of a side a snide comment here saying oh the four and a half star rating you got in that triple threat match that tag team match you had on pay-per-view it's like hey like that's an off night for the Bucks the Bucks want a triple threat tag title match with the other two teams in this scenario next week there's a huge FTR chant when that match is starting to get made but then Nick shuts them down by saying you know we're better than them you all know that come on the way he says that made me laugh so we're getting the triple threat next week which should be awesome and it's just they definitely seem to be building toward this inevitable confrontation between the Bucks and FTR one more time. Now that, you know, you got all the tag gold here, I can imagine this one's going to be for all the marbles, as they say. But whenever that happens, probably an all out, it's going to be great. But yeah, the, the way they're kind of building and not putting FTR in that picture just yet, you know, I totally get why they're doing it. I think the, the anticipation is going to make the put the eventual blow off huge. Malachi Black cutting a promo about the main event tonight. He says he envies John Moxley because of the pain and suffering and the violence that Moxley will surely experience at the hands of Brody King in the main event tonight. Back to ringside, we see Eddie Kingston make his way to the ring. A small minor detail that I happened to uh, miss last week in the Blood and Guts match. I erroneously said that there was a double submission on top of the cage. It was actually Claudio who made Matt Menard tap before Kingston could make Chris Jericho tap. Uh, my bad. Kingston says he wants another shot at Jericho because he couldn't make Jericho bleed last week. But as he's talking, we see Chris Jericho on the screen. And he says, I'm going to show you how crazy I can get. Camera pans out to reveal that Ruby Soho has been beaten down and she's staggering and the rest of the Jericho Appreciation Society is kind of like sitting and watching. And then Ty Conti slams the car door into Ruby's hand. They gave her the Dustin Rhodes treatment just from a couple of years ago. And so they run off and everything. And so building more of that heat, uh, they've established that Kingston and Soho have a friendship going back many years. And they really kind of, they, they really built on that more last week during Blood and Guts and the hype package for that. So man, it really feels like this episode of, of Dynamite has gotten just like you're really edgy and gritty with like Christian talking about drunk brothers and Ruby Soho getting her hands smashed in a car door. It's I feel like man all that big heavy stuff is coming at once. But now it's time for something wholesome. The Dark Order make their way to the ring. They are in 
Rochester, which is the home of Brody Lee. Uh, John Silver on the mic saying it's Dark Order Country. And Negative One, of course, is there too. Uh, Evil Uno on the mic saying they have a big announcement for everyone is that they are not going anywhere. Dark Order forever. And then he hands the mic to Negative One before he can say anything. QT Marshall interrupts and he basically wants to fight Negative One one on one. He threatens to break all of his toys if he doesn't get the match he wants. Suddenly, though, Hangman Page comes out and he helps get QT Marshall into the ring and everyone just hits him with all their finishers, just beat the fuck out of him one after the other, boom, boom, boom. And then finally at the end, negative one grabs the mic and uh, says, you know, I'm going to wait to pin you when I turn 18. And that's the end of that segment. You know, it was uh, it was fun. It was cute. And I think it was a nice little uh, gesture and a nice thing to do for Brody Lee's family in the hometown like that. And it's to really kind of, you know, again, more feel good stuff for the Dark Order. I talked about that in this week's uh, long form about my uh, video about jobber stables. The Dark Order now are just kind of like in that kind of permanent state of being just a beloved group in AEW. Um, and I think, yeah, no reason to stop that uh, for the time being. Grudge match up ahead as Penta Oscuro takes on Roosh, making his in-ring debut for Dynamite. And he and Andrade El Idolo are bringing back La Faccion and Gobernable, and they're trying to steal everyone's masks in the process here. Uh, before the break, Alex Abrahantes actually tackles Jose the Assistant, and they brawl their way to the back during the break. Great back and forth in this one. These guys uh, have great chemistry, and it really shows here. I loved what they did in this match. Roosh going after the mask throughout. That's the big story here since Roosh is very fixated on, on taking he and Phoenix's masks. Uh, Penta with the pile driver, Andrade putting Roosh's feet on the ropes, and while the referee is distracted by that, Roosh hits a low blow and takes the mask off of Penta's head, rolls him up and covers and pins him to win the matchup here. And so they steal one again, and you know, when they get that tag team match with, you know, Roosh and Andrade versus the Lucha Brothers, that match is going to be pretty amazing. I can't wait for that one. By the way, I have to mention, I I love the fact that Roosh still has his ROH theme when he comes to the ring. And speaking of which, a new Ring of Honor logo has debuted just in time for the return of Death Before Dishonor happening later this month, where they confirm that Samoa Joe and Jay Lethal will be happening for the TV title, and there will be more matches being announced later in the show. We're back to the adventures of Tony Nese and Mark Sterling on their quest for signatures, and they run into Orange Cassidy, but Orange flatly says, I don't look at anything without my lawyer present. Then suddenly Danhausen shows up in his best lawyer attire or some reasonable facsimile thereof. And so he basically steals Mark Sterling's idea of having a match between Orange and Tony Nese uh, this Friday on Rampage. Now, I don't know if, this, if the stipulation is specifically Orange must sign this petition should he lose, but that's kind of what brought about this match happening in the first place was Nice telling him, I'll make you sign that contract. So again, Dan Housen in his version of lawyer attire is pretty great. And we go to our next match now as the Gun Club and the Acclaimed take on Ruffin It and Fuego Del Sol. Today I learned that Ruffin It is the name of Bear Country and Leon Ruff. I dig it. Uh, Max Caster does not get to do his opening rap as Austin Gunn steals the microphone uh, before he can do it. They're, of course, building the tension between those two teams. Pretty short and sweet match here. Austin Gunn stealing the victory with a blind tag after the acclaim seemed to have won it for the team. The two teams start scrapping. Uh, Daddy ass, Billy Gunn, he runs in there to break it up, but he attacks the acclaimed instead. And there's a, just a great moment. You gotta believe they're gonna play this in, in, in promo packages for, for years to come, where Bowens is kind of like at to daddy ass and he holds the scissor fingers up and then Billy Gunn just hits them with the famous sir and that's that. So now it tur turns out that Billy Gunn has chosen family over the acclaimed after all. Um, that, that sad emotional moment by Bowens. I guess is this this must be a way to turn the acclaimed baby face, which it feels like they've kind of been for a while, especially since doing the stuff with the, with the gun club, doing the whole shtick and how over that opening rap and Anthony Bowens is shouting is now. It makes sense for them to be baby faces, I think. So if this is the way for them to make that full turn, I'm for it. We get a promo from Miro. He's still salty about getting the black mist sprayed in his face at Forbidden Door. And so he wants a piece of Malachi Black. He's in a rage for sure. Up next, Thunderstorm. That's Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm take on Marina Shafir and Nyla Rose. I like how Nyla and Shafir are bringing out umbrellas for symbolism because they're fighting the Thunderstorm. And Marina Shafir just looking just so stoic and serious badass while holding the umbrella in her hand. The open umbrella is probably one of the best things she's done in her entire time so far in AEW. Some good holds and counter holds between Thunder and Marina early on here. I think 
think whatever lack of chemistry I saw between them when they had a one-on-one -on -one match a few weeks ago seems to have dissipated here. I think this is probably one of Marina's best performances just on an individual level that I've seen uh, from her so far on the show. Uh, Nyla decking Tony with the umbrella when the referee's not looking. That takes us into commercial break where Tony takes a lot of the heat. Uh, Thunder gets the hot tag and goes wild. The two work together on an assisted uh, driver on Shafir for Thunderstorm to win the matchup here. So not sure how much mileage these two are going to get as a team, but I mean, like the, the name's pretty badass and pretty pretty serendipitous that, that, that those two are together and making a team to make that name. It's perfect. And so, yeah, I could see them kind of winning a few more matches, but maybe building up to some kind of rematch down the line. Maybe we can build towards something where Tony turns heel and uh, wants another shot at Thunder uh, in a different, maybe not, not face versus face alignment anymore, but a clear face heel distinction. So we'll have to see where this team goes. Tony Schiavone backstage with Jade Cargill and crew, but Jade is upset and wants to know from Stokely Hathaway, what's the deal last week with Layla Gray? And I was thinking, wait, you waited until an entire week later to bring this up, like now here in the interview segment? But Stokely says, you know, bringing Layla in as an interim baddie. He says, if we can have an interim champion, we can have interim baddies. And according to his math, three on two is a lot better than two on two. And as he's doing this, he's trying to kind of like hit on Layla Gray, like put his arm around her and she's like brushing him off and trying to talk with her one on one, but she doesn't really want a part of it. So more of that dynamic there, but it should be interesting to see what happens with this interim baddie situation. Then we get a whole bunch of matches basically announced for Death Before Dishonor. We've got Daniel Garcia challenging Wheeler Yuta for a match with the ROH Pure Championship for the show. And then after the commercial break, FTR challenging the Briscoe Brothers to a rematch at the pay-per-view for the ROH tag belt. And again, if it's anything like the match they had in Dallas earlier this year uh, at Supercard, then yes, please. I cannot wait to see those two teams tangle again. In your main event, John Moxley defends the AEW Interim World Championship for the first time against the House of Black's Brody King. King. I love the fact that I love the way this match was set up in the first place for King to win that Royal Rampage match on Friday and kind of a dark horse thing too. Not somebody you would immediately expect to be put in a match like that from the get go. But I love these two facing off here. It's just like what a great clash of styles to make for a really fun physical matchup here. I mean, they're just going they're going hard at each other from the get-go here, fighting in the ring and out. Uh, during the break, one of my favorite parts is Moxley hitting a few chops and King just lays him out with one. That was great stuff. It's a great story here of each man weathering the other's storm and neither man really giving an inch for a while. It's like King is taking everything Moxley can throw at him and give it right back to him and in reverse. Uh, Moxley persists. He hits the paradigm shift, gets a sleeper hold locked in and uh, King tries to fight out of it, but Moxley is is tenacious, gets it into the bulldog choke, and that allows him to win by submission. So uh, Moxley is successful here in a great, great, really fun, really physical matchup here. If you like a match with two guys just beating the hell out of each other, uh, then this one would certainly, hopefully, whet your appetite. And I, I love the main event. Yay for Brody King. Uh, having seen him come through Ring of Honor before he before he went to AEW, it's just so cool to see him uh, excelling now in AEW and getting that opportunity. Hopefully, there'll be more more opportunities for more matches like that for King in the future. And that's how the show basically ends as we go to break. The feed that I watched of the show has some like post-match segment though, where you see Brody King making his way up the ramp. Malachi Black shows up to kind of like comfort him. And then out comes Sting and Darby Allen. And Darby was the last man eliminated by King in that rampage, that Royal Rampage last week. So he wanted to extend his hand and say, you've earned this. But then King thinks about it and, and, and balks. He does not accept the handshake and goes, off. So not sure what that's going to lead to, but then Darby and Sting pose, and that's the end of the feed that I watched. My grade for this week's episode of Dynamite is a B. Uh, not a lot of holes for me to poke into this show. I think this was, you know, not an earth-shattering show, not like a record-setting bombastic, amazing show where you're going to remember everything that happened three weeks from now. But I just think it was a solid ass show. It started strong with a TNT title match, ended strong with the world title match, had a pretty uh, solid undercard. And like I said, that main event was great too. I, you know, my one thing I worry about is I hope that Christian doesn't keep pounding this edgy promo thing into the ground to the point where it's no longer novel or interesting. Uh, but I think that for the most part, everything on this show delivered. And so, you know, it's building toward death 
path before Dishonor and further still toward All Out, but I think they're doing a pretty good job here with the presentation. But let me know what you thought about this week's Dynamite in the comments section below, and be sure to keep your eyes and ears peeled because I will have an announcement in the coming days as to my involvement at StarCast happening later this month, SummerSlam weekend in Nashville, Tennessee, and of course, that's going to be the site StarCast will be of Ric Flair's last match. Big news I'm going to announce in the coming days, but until then, folks, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.